Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sasha Peterson. I'm the Managing Director of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for one a webinar in the ASAP member webinar series. I'm really excited today to get a sneak peek from the folks at the University of Michigan for the city's impacts and adaptation tool, and it's just hot off the presses, so this is a great opportunity to get some insights into how it works and then ask some questions, have some good discussion about how it's being used. So just a quick quick update for those of you who are not familiar with ASAP, and then we'll jump into the webinar, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion after the webinar is over. So for background on ASAP, we now have more than 800 members across the country, which is awesome across a variety of sectors. About 35% are from government, local, state, federal, and tribal government. 30% are from nonprofit sector. 20% are affiliated with academic institutions. About 15% of our members are from the private sector. So if you haven't already signed up or if you know someone who thinks about climate change, adaptation, and preparedness and should be involved, definitely Send them along. Membership is free, adaptationprofessionals.org. Here's a snapshot of that membership across the United States. You can see we pretty, have a pretty wide geographic distribution of members, including many in the Midwest. And if you search, um, our two presenters are today are at the University of Michigan, and they are located there in that central area. So we have a great search function to help you find other members and interesting resources and articles like this tool. The other thing I wanted to highlight before we jump into the presentation is the is ASAP's 2015 Prize for Progress in Adaptation. So this is an award for organizations and communities that are taking action to reduce their vulnerabilities to climate impacts and be better prepared. With the award, the call for applications is now open and will be till the almost the end of January, the 23rd of January. So think about that and help us spread the word. If you know someone that's doing great work on adaptation, putting it on the ground, then this is a way for them to get recognized for that. And the winners will be selected and awards will be presented at the National Adaptation Forum next May. Also wanted to highlight our next webinar is a joint webinar with the Security and Sustainability Forum. It's recommendations from the Resilience and Preparedness Task Force from the White House. It's next week, 12 p.m. Eastern, and you can use that link there to register for it. We'll have some of the elected officials and the staff members who are actually involved with writing the report talking about, you know, what went into it, what the recommendations say, and how they got to those recommendations. So I'm excited about that, but not nearly as excited as I am about today's webinar. We have two great presenters. So Dan Brown is the University of Michigan. He uh, holds a master's degree in physics from Michigan State University and a master's degree in atmospheric science from Oregon State University before working as a climate researcher associated with the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessment Center. He worked for the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute and his primary role with GLISA is to analyze climate trends and provide synthesis of scientific information for decision makers on climate adaptation. We also have Ashley Grace, and she's the Urban Adaptation Program Manager for the University of Michigan's Climate Center. She assists mid-sized cities in the region by providing place-based climate information and strategies to improve policy decisions, infrastructure investments, and awareness efforts related to climate adaptation. She has a master's degree from the University of Michigan in Natural Resource and Environmental Management and in Urban and Regional Planning. She was also the National Program Coordinator at the Alliance for Climate Education. So it's a really great team of presenters we have here, and I'm excited to have them share this tool. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them. We'll let them take it away. Sasha, we are excited to be here today. Let me just make sure I'm all right. And I can see your screen. Great. Thank you. All right. So as you said, I'm sitting here with Dan Brown, the climatologist here at the Climate Center. My name is Ashley Grace, the Urban Adaptation Project Manager. Uh, we are both at the University of Michigan Climate Center, um, which is part of actually the Grand Sustainability Institute. And before I get started uh, with the tool, I just want to give you a little background on where this tool is coming from. So this tool is a result of a four-year um, urban adaptation project called the Great Lakes Adaptation Assessment for Cities. 
It was a project funded both by the Kresge Foundation as well as the Graham Sustainability Institute. And over the course of the four years, we worked with urban practitioners throughout the Great Lakes region to assist them in their adaptation planning efforts and also learn from them as we did that um, on what were the resources they needed as well as what we could do to help them um, move their efforts forward. Again, this is an outcome of that project. The idea is that this tool can help practitioners as they move forward with their adaptation efforts. Uh, we built it with three goals in mind. The first is to provide urban practitioners with the relevant climate information that they need for those adaptation efforts. The second is to provide um, support in strategic networking and helping different practitioners connect um, around adaptation efforts. And then finally, to provide practitioners with a database of real-world adaptation strategies that they can dig through and, and find those that would be useful and relevant um, for their own communities. So I des we designed this presentation. It's actually a series of screenshots. We, instead of going through the tool and leaving that up to the hope that technology would work, we decided to go old-fashioned and put a, a series of screenshots together, but these screenshots are um, taken directly from the tool and what you would actually see if you were to be walking through the tool yourself. Um, and finally, I do want to say that although that this, this tool was definitely designed with the urban practitioner in mind, a lot of the climate data is um, on a regional level and can be used um, by organizations beyond just the municipal scale. So um, although you know, some of the entry points to the tool are city uh, or at the urban level, the data and information in it can be a, meet a variety of needs. So this is the landing page that you would see if you were to come to our tool. Uh, there's a little bit of a description um, on the right of what this tool is aimed at doing. But really, we encourage folks to use this tool, especially if they're um, an urban practitioner with a climate concern or uh, climate impact that they have in mind, and then that can help kind of guide the way that they use this tool. So for, for this example, we're going to pretend we are practitioners from the city of Gary, Indiana, concerned about um, increasing precipitation and, and, and perhaps what it might, uh, the impact it has on combined sewer overflows and that kind of thing. So the first thing we would do is come in and we would select Indiana from this drop-down list. Uh, again, you'll see all eight states that touch the Great Lakes and Ontario. Um, are included in this tool. Um, then we would click uh, on Gary, Indiana as the city. You will notice that we did uh, draw the threshold at 20,000 or above as far as cities that are represented on the tool. Um, and then once you hit enter, it'll take you to this main landing page, which you can see on the top there, it confirms that you are Gary, Indiana, or the, the information that you put in to enter the tool. And then um, the four tabs underneath it, the first is the user guide. The second um, is climate information, getting at that relevant, our goal of providing relevant climate data. The third is our map, which helps us achieve that goal of uh, strategic networking. And then the final tab is adaptation strategies. So we're going to go through all of them and start with the user guide. And with that, I'm going to turn that over to Dan Brown. So this is Dan. You're looking at now the user guide uh, front page, and we've just selected the overview tab. So this is just get, intended to give you know, a broad introduction to the tool, what we hope they'll get out of using the tool. And you can see up in the upper right, uh, we've got you know, sort of the standard uh, introduction on how to use that in a video that you could watch if, if you wanted to go through that. It's very informative. Down below you see the climate division and climate peers. These are the two real core concepts of the tool that we hope people will think about as they're working through it and remember after they've used the tool, uh, thinking about that conceptually. And I'll talk about each of those more as we go through, but uh, climate divisions are sort of the unit that we, we have stuck to in talking about climate as it changes and what the trends are regionally. Climate peers are really the, the concept we use to link areas with different climates uh, or areas that might have a similar climate in the future, uh, a way to link different communities around the region. So we'll go through both of those a little bit later. <clears throat> Clicking through the tabs around the Climate Division tab, 
so climate divisions are a little foreign to, to people that maybe are coming outside the climate field. So they're actually a standard division set up by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's intended that they link areas or group areas of similar climate, similar drivers. Uh, so if you look out west or along California, you know, you'd see you know, the Central Valley, you'd see the coast ranges, you'd see the mountains. Uh, in the Midwest, the Great Lakes region, because our climate is driven somewhat by lake effects, but changes really in broad brushstrokes across the whole region in terms of temperature and precipitation, they've tended just to break those up along political boundaries of counties just, just for convenience. There's about nine or ten per state. Uh, and that tends to be the resolution where we can reliably talk about differences in trends or how things have changed at that sub-regional level. So that's sort of that tangible unit that keeps things local and people can sort of think about what that means. You know, if you're coming from Traverse City with Northwest Michigan, uh, you know, if you're coming from Northwest Indiana, uh, you know, thinking about that area, you know, these are tangible areas that you can consider and think about. Changes a little bit as you go out east and you get into the mountains with New York, looking at you know, the Adirondacks, uh, the Finger Lakes region, the divisions tend to follow uh, the mountain ranges and the valleys as those tend to force climate pretty dramatically as you get out in that area. So it gets a little bit more tricky uh, looking to the eastern end of, end of the region. Across Canada, one of the challenges we had, uh, there is no similar division of climate uh, like there is in the U.S. So we had to come up with a means for looking at Canada uh, for which we could represent climate realistically, that the data was good enough, that it was robust enough to talk about how climate is in a specific region, dealing with a lot of the challenges that are unique to Canada. So as you look farther north, of course, there are fewer stations, um, fewer elements of data that we can use uh, reliably to look at Canada that requires us to sort of group larger areas uh, within uh, Ontario. Um, so what we did was we followed census group or census division data for Ontario. They don't necessarily call them census tracts, I don't think. Uh, but we used their, their census blocks or groups of census blocks to give us those divisions across Ontario. I should say that these are based entirely, uh, or, well, in the old versions, they were based entirely on data. And the newer data set that just came out in 2013, they are strongly based on actual observations taken at stations. Uh, and then they are interpolated to cover areas, uh, you know, thinking about the Upper Peninsula, where there's fewer people, fewer stations. Uh, they do some interpolation to get a more accurate measurement of past climate. Uh, so these are a good way to really anchor the discussion around changes in climate to actual observations that we can point to and say, this has actually happened in your area. So it's a really good entry point for talking about uh, climate changes. We started thinking about the climate peers. <clears throat> As I said, this is a way to link areas that you may not necessarily link intuitively together around changes in climate. Uh, so as you can see in this example that we have uh, looking at Milwaukee and Springfield, Illinois, so the climate peer question really asks, is there a location that its current climate looks like what your future climate will look like? So thinking about somewhere like Milwaukee, you're going to look farther south. In the very near future, you'd probably look at somewhere like Chicago. A little bit farther away, you're going to start looking down farther south in Illinois, like Springfield, uh, St. Louis, those kind of areas. Uh, and that's what that arrow is indicating, is that here's what your climate will look like in the future if you're in Milwaukee. It might look like Springfield, Illinois, or those other places in those blue divisions. We base this on seasonal measurements of temperature and precipitation. And we do that because uh, even though the drivers of climate, you know, if, if you're in Gary, Indiana, or if you're in 
uh, you know, a lake effect dominated area, you, you might see more precipitation during different times of the year uh, from very different drivers of climate, whether that be lake effect or, you know, your, your big storm events during the summer, what have you. But we look at these seasonal blocks of time for temperature and precipitation, how much is your, your temperature going to rise, how much is your precipitation going to change. We look at it at a seasonal block of time because uh, if you're thinking about stormwater management and other issues, um, you know, the result of the temperature and the precipitation is what we want you to focus on. Um, if you're getting to the same place even with different drivers, we still want you to talk to different places that are facing the same issues even though the reasons for those issues might be very different. This gives you potential connections to places that you might not usually talk to. It also gives us a lot more flexibility in uh, linking different different areas as the data is quite a bit uh, more challenging to look at on a hyperlocal scale, which is what you need to look at extreme events and things like that. The next tab is really talking about adaptation strategies, and I'll let Ashley go into this a bit more, but you know, taking sort of the climate information, the climate peers, hopefully people have identified other communities or other folks that they'd want to talk to, um, and they can also find adapt adaptation strategies around the issues that they uh, would like to look into further. And then, of course, there's a, a full tutorial, uh, again, just going through kind of the steps of using the tool uh, of interpreting the climate information as it's presented to you. So as an example, we're just going to look at Northwest Indiana, uh, specifically Gary, Indiana, and what a user would see looking at the Climate tab. So we're now on the Climate Overview section. Again, we've got another tutorial up there in the upper right to, to explain a lot of what I'm going to say. Uh, and then we've got the map of where this division lies, what counties are included in this subregion that we're describing in the data below. So we've got current observed change and projected change for temperature and precipitation in two tables down below. And the overarching goal of this page, of this information, is to really give people a sense of where they've been, where they are, and where they're going. As I said, for the where they've been and where they are, we're relying heavily on that climate divisional data, that observed, actual observed data in temperature and precipitation. And we break that down seasonally by trend. Uh, it turns out Gary is actually a very typical region uh, for what we're seeing uh, throughout the larger Great Lakes Basin, larger Great Lakes region, uh, where we have an annual temperature increase that's modest, uh, but we have larger increases during the winter almost a factor of two higher, um, larger increases in the spring, and, and so on, uh, with projected changes very much in line with, with what we've seen, uh, potentially even accelerating. One thing I talk about is in those projected changes, uh, for both temperature and precipitation, we look at a range. Uh, the models, particularly for precipitation, differ often substantially at this smaller subregional scale. Uh, the statistics are less robust as you look at a smaller and smaller scale. So we want to make sure we don't miss anything. We want to make sure we cover all plausible futures. Uh, so we present a range of the model projections for that region. Uh, and the hope is that somebody will look at the observed change, where they are, and then the envelope of the projections, and if that trajectory kind of follows a line. If the trajectory of where you've been, where you are, then lines up within that envelope of where you're going, uh, we hope that that would give them some ideas of you know, responsible decisions to make or responsible interpretations of how the climate is changing for them. This is particularly important when we look at precipitation down below. So we've given them their inches of precipitation in their sort of current status on the left column. The observed changes and the projected changes are in percentage. We've arrived at presenting that 
uh, in terms of percentage simply because inches of precipitation or volume of precipitation is a hard concept for, for many to visualize, including myself, even looking at this information a lot. Uh, it, it's not necessarily clear how much you know, an inch or two inches of precipitation change, uh, you know, what that means tangibly. Uh, but talking about a percentage difference over a block of time is something that hopefully people can relate to. Um, a savvy viewer will notice as you look down that column that the numbers for percent change don't add up. Um, there are a couple reasons for that. One is that uh, you're talking about percentage changes for each season, uh, but then also the sum of the averages isn't the average of the sum. So a couple of mathematical uh, hang-ups there. But, uh, but if you're comparing within a season type, so if you're comparing summer past to summer future, um, then those numbers work out just fine. Um, and you can compare how things have changed within a season as you look down the table. You just can't compare different season types um, against one another. So again, Gary's sort of a very typical case on this, seeing uh, sort of a modest high increase in precipitation, around 6%, um, with precipitation increasing during the winter observed by about 10%. Uh, and in the fall, about 15%, with uh, more modest increases in the spring and summer. Uh, what's really interesting is actually a really good example what we see throughout the region is if you looked in those projected ranges off to the right, you can then see that you know, those, those envelopes are large, and they're including zero in many cases, but they are heavily shifted towards positive or negative, uh, in most cases, to the positive. Uh, so just quickly looking across at winter, you see it's negative 4.2 to positive 25.6. So looking across that table, seeing an observed change that's positive, and then an envelope of change that uh, projected for the future that's heavily shifted to the positive, you would expect, of course, that precipitation in the winter is going to continue to increase. Uh, looking at the summer, however, you reach the opposite conclusion, seeing there this very modest, nearly stable change in precipitation, but then uh, seeing a potentially negative uh, change in precipitation for the future. This is actually one of the more counterintuitive points uh, that we often uh, hit in the Great Lakes region, which is that even though precipitation goes up annually, uh, there is a chance that it could go down in the summer. So you have both the risk of drought uh, with extreme storms and more precipitation, which can give you more flashy flows and a whole bunch of other things. So there's a lot of information in there. We wouldn't necessarily hope that they would see all of that just by looking at these numbers, but it would be a good entry point that they might ask more questions as they're looking through this table, uh, and they might come up with good ideas for how to move forward in terms of adaptation practices. Looking farther down the page, uh, we provide some information that uh, comes from our GLISA set of climate division summaries or divisional climatologies. So this is just looking at the temperature and precipitation record throughout time from 1900. Uh, the reds are temperature, the blues are precipitation. Those solid lines are nine-year running averages, and we have stuck to that time frame for sort of our longish term average to capture you know, the, the natural variability that occurs on sort of that scale. So El Nino, La Nina cycles, other oscillations, um, you know, periods like we're going through now that could potentially be colder periods. Um, you know, we capture some of that natural variation while still uh, highlighting what the long-term trend has been, which you can see in the, the annual temperature in the upper left there is, is trending certainly up, but with periods of variation. Uh, same goes for precipitation. Uh, the open circles, of course, show the year-to-year -year variation, and that's a, a key point that even though we're talking about these long-term trends, you can still have a year or two or many uh, in that trend that is, is completely opposite the direction of the long-term trend. Uh, so even if precipitation is going up, that doesn't mean will be a high precipitation out. Uh, so capturing sort of that essence of variability 
annual and long term. As you click down, uh, you can go into the map, and I'm going to hand it back over to Ashley to describe that. Actually, if I can go back, uh, you'll notice also at the very bottom there's a print climate info button, uh, which prints the data to a PDF uh, so you can take it with you, uh, present that as you need it. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Ashley to talk about the map interface. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, so yeah, that was the user guide and the climate tab, and we'll be moving on to the map tab. So if you click on that, there's a little green button that will appear that says View Map. And if you click on that, it will take you to our interactive um, web interface. And so uh, this is essentially what it would look like. I'm going to walk you through a couple of um, a couple of the filters here on the left, and that's where pretty much all of your tools are for navigating around this map. Um, as Dan mentioned or described earlier, the point of this map is to help identify climate peers. Uh, so peers are, again, those, those uh, divisions in blue whose current climate matches what your future climate is projected to look like uh, with a 40-year planning horizon. Um, so what you'll normally see when you come into this tool, the default is that the season is summer and the climate uh, criteria is set at temperature. And again, we're, we're going to look at this as if we're you know, planning practitioners from Gary, Indiana. Notice that both winter and spring are looking like they're going to be experiencing more precipitation. So we're going to use these filters first. Starting with summer, we're going to change that to winter. And as you can see, that changes what our climate peer divisions are. We'll then change uh, the climate criteria to include precipitation. Previously, it was just temperature. Now it's temperature and precipitation. And now I'm going to start digging in into these, some, of, some of these divisions. So for instance, in this case, we're going to look at uh, southwest Ohio, as that might be somewhere that Gary, Indiana, maybe can associate with or identifies with. So we're going to start by looking at Gary, Indi or, sorry, uh, southwest Ohio for some climate peer cities. So when you click on a climate division, um, a couple of interesting things happen. First, you'll see a bunch of blue dots pop up, and those are all cities within that climate division that have populations of 20,000 or above. And then everything I'm going to do from here on is filter those cities so I can really find a city that I or Gary, Indiana, might identify with um, as a means, again, for that strategic networking, as a means of finding a city that I feel comfortable potentially reaching out to and asking you know, how they handle their precipitation. Uh, so I'll first start with the population. Oh, sorry, before I do, um, I want to draw your attention to the selection box because that's going to continue to change with different input depending on what I'm clicking on. So you'll see different pieces of useful information. And so when I click on the division, the first thing you'll see is just why that is your climate peer division. So it'll talk about temperature and precipitation so you get, get a better idea of why those two were matched up in the first place. Now I'm going to filter the cities, um, starting with the population. So you can filter the cities that you're looking at uh, based on population, so plus or minus, uh, anywhere from uh, 10,000 to 100,000, so to help you find a, a city that aligns with your uh, population. You know, Chicago and Gary, Indiana might not be very useful comparison, given that the resources are going to vary pretty dramatically because of population size, et cetera. So, you, so, for instance, in this case, I used 50,000, and that took off a number of blue dots or cities. Uh, we can then use our demographic filter, which is at uh, number three. You can see there are a couple of different things you can click on there um, to help filter or further refine the number of cities you're looking at. And these are all filters that they come from the census, but we heard from a number of practitioners as we were creating this tool. These are the types of things that they think of when they're comparing themselves to other cities and, and finding peer cities. So there's median construction date, per capita income, percent population below poverty line, percent owner-occupied housing, percent population over 65. Um, and so after clicking on a couple of those filters that might be relevant for stormwater manage managers, uh, we see that two cities are left. Uh, so I clicked on one, and that's what that yellow dot around it indicates that that has been highlighted. And, and now that I have, you'll see um, that 
all of that demographic information I was talking about will actually appear in that selections window. So again, you can really get a better sense of just how closely Gary would match up with Hamilton on Ohio. Um, and so this is just one, this is just a quick example of how we envision practitioners using this and how we, I mean, we worked with practitioners to build this tool. The idea being that they can go through these different climate divisions um, and find those peers that they really identify with. Uh, a couple, one other really interesting thing that I want to point out are the climate stations. So if you go to that fourth tab on the tool, you'll see climate stations. And if you pull that up and then click on uh, those boxes at the top that say closest climate station, climate stations, it'll um, populate the map with all the different climate stations. So that you can, so divisions help give us a, a good idea of the trend and what the region is experiencing, while uh, climate stations help us get a better idea of extremes which is also something that um, is very useful for when you're planning infrastructure and that kind of thing. So if you click on those, you can then look at the extremes um, by the, of the nearest climate station. Um, that selection box that popped up doesn't match exactly the one on the left, but the one that popped up is actually populated with all of the um, climate station data that you would normally see in that selections box. Um, yeah, there's a... That has to do with the screenshot. Normally, you'll see what the, the smaller selection box that popped out has all that extreme data. Um, and then if you hit, click on number five, it'll tell you um, how to print out what you're seeing on the map so that you can actually take that and put it in a presentation, that kind of thing. And then finally, um, there is that button on the bottom left that says return to report. And in general, just always look for those green navigation buttons when you, using this tool, the back button doesn't always work very well in your back browser, so definitely look for the green navigation button. So finally, we're going to talk about adaptation strategies. So um, over the past couple years, we have compiled, actually at this point, over 550 strategies that have been taken from plans all across the country and, on, and Canada that are adaptation strategies. Uh, they may come from a more standard climate action plan or a sustainability plan, but they come from other sources as well, parks and rec plans, um, uh, stormwater infrastructure plans, and all sorts of other plans. So you can uh, basically, this tab helps you filter um, and search through that database that we have created and are continuing to add to and populate. So there's a couple of different filters. There's the climate driver, climate impact, city, and region. Uh, you can use all or none, and just like anything, when you, the more filters you add, the more refined your search will be. So we'll start with climate driver again. If we were in Gary, Indiana, if they were um, concerned with increasing or precipitation, if you were to click on that, uh, you would get around 270 strategies would pop up. Um, and then we could further refine that by using climate impact, so uh, we could be concerned with sewer overflows or loss of urban tree canopy or, or a number of different things, so kind of helping us filter that down. Um, and then what you'll get when you hit search is this long list of climate impacts that you can look through. And a couple of really interesting things pop up. Um, first, you can see the, the standard um, filters that we use above, the driver, the impact, uh, the city. But you also get a sense of what the actual action is. We give you a quick description. Um, a link to the document that we found it in, as well as uh, the department that uh, is responsible for this strategy. And, and even just here in this example, you can see in Ann Arbor alone, they're dealing with stormwater management, um, both in their parks and rec department, their planning and development, and there's a number of other Ann Arbors below that. So I know that they have it in a number of planning, or excuse me, another a number of city departments are addressing stormwater management, um, and you can get a link to all these different types of strategies um, to help give you an idea of what's possible. Um, and then finally, we also have a print strategies button, so if you wanted to print these strategies out, you could do that as well. Um, so as I said, this is actually a part of the tool that we're continuing to develop and continuing to do research on, and one of the questions we get quite frequently is, well, what if I have a strategy I'd like to add? Um, we would love to add more strategies, and if you have them, you can either email them to me or uh, with my, that's my contact info right there under Ashley Grace. Or there's also a CIOT email that's part of the tool. If you click on that, you can email that um, email address and that will come directly to me as well. And, you know, we're really, we're really interested in continuing to build up that, that part of the tool. So I'm um, looking forward to hopefully hearing from a few of you. And uh, 
that is all we have for now. And I guess um, we'll open it up for questions. Great. Thank you, Ashley and Dan. What a lot of information and looks like a really useful tool. So um, for those of you on the line, uh, if you raise your hand, if you have a specific question, then I'll just unmute you so you can ask your question directly to the two of them. And I'm going to start off with just a couple of quick questions while the folks on the line are thinking about their questions. So first, this tool, is this tool live at that URL that you were showing? Yep, it's live there. You can also, if you were to just go to the gramumich.edu climate um, pages, you could also easily navigate to it. But yeah, you can either use the URL right there or, or come to our general pages. Okay, excellent. It is live. Oh, good. So if people want to go and just play around with it and check it out and kind of get a feel for how you were clicking through and, you know, the type of information that comes up and the type of filtering they can do, they could just go and do that. There's no, like, registration or anything. Yeah, it's absolutely open. Anyone who goes to the tool can use it. Don't need to register or anything. Okay. Great. Um, so one of the things, um, this question for Dan, one of the things that struck me as you were going through the different climate zones and like comparing and looking at changes in seasonal averages um, and then Ashley brought it up too and kind of when you look at individual weather stations is the extreme events side of it so I was curious your take on that because I feel like frequently what really drives the impacts of climate change are those extreme events and showing kind of the seasonal changes like oh, okay you know your seasonal precipitation is going to go up but how do you get to the point where you know, like, oh, well, is it all going to come at one time during the spring? Like, in one day, I'm going to get all my spring precipitation, or is it going to be spread out? Like, how do how do I get to the point where I start to think about, you know, that extreme precipitation event, whether it's going to be more frequent in the future, and then start thinking about what I can do about it? Yeah, that's that's a really great question, and that's that's kind of the ultimate goal of, you know, ideally thinking about how we would want. Uh, you know, two communities to go through sort of the whole plot arc of how this would work. Uh, this tool would really be one of the initial steps um, where they're looking at, I don't want to say broad changes in climate, but a little bit broader changes in climate regionally, sub-regionally, uh, and then they eventually are talking, you know, two communities are talking about uh, specific issues uh, that have come up. Uh, so, you know, thinking about uh, flooding, you, you know, maybe you want uh, somebody up around Thunder Bay talking to somebody in Milwaukee or something like that about extreme precipitation, about infrastructure design, things like that. That's, that's kind of the ideal plot arc that we would want them to follow. Um, in terms of looking at extreme events at the station scale versus uh, linking climate by you know, this, this regional scale and seasonally, um, you know, the first step of that is just seeing how much broadly you're going to change within each season. So if you're interested in different types of seasonal change, um, where would you look? So extreme precipitation events, you probably would be looking at summer and spring, um, things like that. As Ashley pointed out, once you've gone through kind of that step, you can then start looking at cities in those regimes that might share uh, extreme precipitation or have more extreme precipitation uh, than you currently do but are projected to have in the future. So there, there are ways to look at that. Uh, from a technical aspect, um, you know, there are 230 stations roughly in in the tool right now that, that pop up as you click on each of those divisions. Um, and coming up with 230, you know, to the end possible combinations of events is just technically tricky. Um, right. So that there's that, doing that on real time, you know, sort of those technical issues. Um, but... but But more broadly than that, you know, it gets into this issue of do you want management? You know, if we get too specific up front and, and really try to get to one thing very quickly, we could end up inadvertently, um, you know, limiting conversations that might have taken place that now won't because we didn't show them uh, sort of the broader picture. So uh, kind of keeping it at that seasonal scale, at least as that very initial step, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we're hoping to take the next step towards those extreme events and those more specific things. But at least as that initial step, we kept it to the, the seasonal block. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have a question from Allison in the group. She was curious what outreach you're doing to reach policymakers and with a particular interest on policymakers on the Hill in D.C. Are you doing any outreach in that regard? Um, I mean, we're very much focused on the Great Lakes region, so uh, we, d we don't currently do much outreach at all to the Hill. Uh, we have one of our, and GLISA, which is what really drives all of our climate information, is a NOAA-funded program. So we do work with the federal government through NOAA, essentially through RISA, or GLISA, which is this um, NOAA-funded regional integrated sciences and assessment. But we don't, uh, we, policy isn't necessarily something we um, have a strict mandate or are working on specifically. So. Right. And what about outreach to, like, connect with the communities in your region or the decision makers in your region? Where is that kind of your target audience? And how are you trying to get this tool out there so they can start using it? Yeah, so our target audience is definitely city practitioners. So um, first off, we have through just the contacts that we've made through the Great Lakes Adaptation Assessment for Cities, which are um, both we worked in depth with six cities, but we also worked with a number of other cities, kind of um, in a less in depth, but definitely important engagement with them. And so we've been uh, letting them know that this tool is finally ready and reaching out to them. We've also been doing this webinar. We did another webinar um, this earlier this week, and again, actually through Glisa, we've been doing a lot of outreach. Um, they work with a number of organizations throughout the region on a variety of projects, so we've also let them know about the tool and have done a demo for them. And then, um, but yeah, we've done a lot of um, outreach to the, the new the, the news sources throughout the region. So uh, we've just this week have really been pushing it out a lot, and I think that we've we've had over I think three or four hundred people look at the tool in just a couple last couple days alone. So oh, that's we've great. Just been doing a big regional push on it. Yeah, excellent. Um, Allison was raising her hand, so she might have a follow-up question. Allison, I'm going to unmute your line, and you can say hi and ask it directly. Allison, are you there? Hello? Hi, Allison. Hi. Hi. This is um, Allison Mize with the Ecological Society of America. And I was asking specifically about outreach to the Hill because, of course, NOAA's budget is determined by um, the Congress. And with the changing um, leadership on the Hill, climate research it has been um, under attack um, on the Hill. Specifically, the House of Representatives had put in their appropriations bill um, to to uh, to flat to zero out any climate related research. When it went to the Senate, the Senate appropriators took that language out of the bill, and so it is not in this appropriations bill. So even though um, uh, uh, people may be doing research with federal agencies, it's actually Congress that sets their budgets. So I would encourage. Um, anyone who is doing climate-related research that specifically goes down to a local level to do some outreach to your congressional representatives through your university, federal relations people, or others, because it's going to, um, it does impact the funding uh, research dollars for climate research. That's it. Yeah, so, so this is Dan. I'll just... I'll just add sort of our perspective on on that, since that's something, of course, we're we're certainly aware of. Uh, since our funding comes through a big chunk of the the U of M Climate Center funding comes through the GLISA, the NOAA RISA program. Right. Um, one of you know, so the, the the broad mandate of the NOAA RISA is to link physical and social science around climate, uh, ecological science. Uh, yeah, wherever these sectors come together around climate, it's really kind of the mandate of the RISAs. Uh, and that, so that's been driving sort of the direction that we take, 
know, the style in which we operate, uh, all those kind of things. Uh, but both at Michigan State and University of Michigan, there are larger initiatives going on that are university-wide in both cases and partnership-wide between the two universities outside of that. And uh, Ashley physically is actually a really good example of that. Um, uh, since you know, she is a U of M Climate Center employee, well, you know, I am technically a GLISA employee, even though our offices are right next to each other. Uh, so, so we have some flexibility and resilience um, you know, to sort of these administrative changes on the Hill um, that allows us, I think, to, to stay local and stay regionally focused, even as big things might be changing around us. Um, so it might change, you know, how we how we operate a little bit or you know, what we tend to focus on, but um, yeah, that's, that's something we're always aware of and constantly thinking about you know, what we can do in many plausible types of futures. Great. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Allison, for the question. Good, good point. And I like the idea of you know, connecting with your university to help make sure you maintain your research funding. Um, the other... The other thing that occurred to me is I was curious how, you know, you talked about kind of the learning, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, like connecting with cities that, you know, are dealing with similar climate issues and then learning from them, both like looking through the adaptation strategies. But then, so how do you, how does this tool or the two of you, how do you help make that happen? Like if I go in and I say, oh, my gosh, I got to learn more about extreme heat because that's what's going to be a real issue for me in the future or I need to learn more about flooding. How do I, how do I find the right people to talk to? a good question and something that we've, you know, had a lot of conversations with our um, municipal uh, practitioners that we were get, getting feedback throughout the process. And we thought about, you know, should we be doing some direct matching up with, oh, your city looks just like XYZ city. But I think after talking to our city practitioners who we thought would be their, you know, their perfect peer, we, we were very often off. And so um, there is some responsibility that we kind of place on the shoulders of the user to help identify, look for cities that they identify with um, and kind of take that step. You know, we have built in all of these features. So you're not just looking, you know, at kind of all these random cities, but you're really zoning, honing in on these, these cities that really do reflect, you know, some very similar traits that your city possesses. So you start with climate. You start with, so if you're concerned about heat, you start by making sure that, you know, you, you put summer in as your season and temperature as your peer, um, your climate criteria, and then you start to filter, you know, you look for those places in the country that you associate with. For instance, you know, we were working with uh, some folks in different parts of Canada, and they'd say, oh, we, we definitely associate with that part of Wisconsin, or we definitely don't associate with that part of Minnesota. We're not going to ever talk to those people. We'll talk to these people or something along those lines. So the idea of being... We didn't feel like it was necessarily our place to tell you who, who exactly you should reach out to, but give you some ideas and ways to filter and identify those groups that you want to reach out to. And, and sometimes, and we've, we've heard this a couple times already, like they were able to identify cities that they already had a great contact with, and then through this tool realize that they have another reason to, to work with that city. <laughs> right. So does your tool help identify individuals, or I would just know that, you know, Ann Arbor is a city that I should talk to about stormwater, and then I just go and try and find that person? Yeah, it doesn't, at this point, there are definitely no um, individuals, but for, again, yeah, so you would look at a city and you would say, I'm, I'll reach out to, you know, if you did see Ann Arbor and you had a contact in Ann Arbor, that could be a great place to start. Um, yeah. But when you get to the adaptation strategy part of the, the tool, you'll actually see, you know, if there's a strategy you're specifically interested in, again, you can actually look through the document that it comes from. Right. And oftentimes, um, you know, city staff or, uh, or there's contact information in that. And or it'll also tell you the department that put the strategy together so you can, you know, start looking on the web for that department um, contact that you'd be most interested in talking to. Yeah, no, it just was occurring to me as we were discussing that you maybe there's a way to, you know, use the ASAP network to help connect people together. So if we have ASAP members in these cities that you mm -hmm. find, you know, could we help make the links there so it wouldn't be quite as, you know, quite as many steps to track down the right people. Um, we have a question from Kent. Um, Kent, are you there? Do you want to ask your question? Uh, 
Yeah, am I unmuted? You are. We hear you great. Go ahead. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I'm here in uh, South Florida, and I took a quick look at the link for the uh, the program, which I'm quite amazed um, at this program. By the way, it's great. Um, but it, I, I'm in South Florida. Is there something like that for South Florida? Unfortunately, this tool was definitely built for the Great Lakes region. We are, um, at this now that we've got this first uh, version of it out there, we are starting to think about what's next. And part of what's been part of that discussion has been whether it would be uh, made into a national tool. So unfortunately, at this point, it is very Great Lakes focused. Um, it has not expanded beyond, but it might in the near future. And in the meantime, I know that there's a really great uh, NOAA-funded RISA down there that would be a great place for resources, which, I don't know, Dan, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So the sort of the, you know, coming back to those core concepts of climate peers, uh, you know, and the divisions, that kind of thing, um, so it's, it's something that fits, I think, particularly well in the northern Midwest and, and most of the northeast. Uh, and it works particularly well because we're far enough north that as climate changes, we can look farther south. Uh, and sort of one of the half-joking questions we always get is, okay, but what if you're in New Orleans? You know, where do you look then? You're just going to be out in the middle right. of Mexico somewhere. Um, and, but, that, that, I mean, that actually is kind of – you know, sort of this conceptual problem is that you go far enough south and then you kind of run out of data uh, to look at in, in this kind of a way of looking at climate peers. Then you, you really do have to start looking overseas and, and other places, um, which is more challenging. Uh, so I think that's probably why you haven't seen it, uh, you know, designed quite in sort of a similar way or, or that, you know, this, this kind of a tool. Uh, in terms of looking at impacts, that are relevant for Florida, there, there's quite a lot around, you know, sea level rise and, uh, and those issues. Um, and the, the Southeastern Regional Climate Center, which is the RCC, uh, NOAA Regional Climate Center for that region, um, uh, and then the RESA out of, I believe it's uh, South, Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah, so the Carolina RESA also would, would also do that. Uh, CISA um, would also have tools about sea level rise, things like that. Uh, how do you spell CISA? So there are a number of institutions. I'm sorry, what's that? Uh, how do you spell CISA you just mentioned? It's I never heard C -I -S -A. of it. It's C-I-S-A. It's the Carolinas RISA uh, as opposed to GLISA, which is the Great Lakes RISA. Right. And then, Kent, the other potential resource down there is the Southeast Regional Florida Climate Change Compact. So it's four counties down there in Southeast Florida. And I work with the Institute for Sustainable Communities, and we're supporting that effort. So they've come together, and I can put you in touch with folks there, and they might be able to connect you, you know, on the research side or on the more practical, like, adaptation strategy development side. Great. I appreciate that. All right, excellent. Well, um, Dan and Ashley, I appreciate you being here today and sharing this information, giving us some sneak peek insight into this tool that's hot off the presses. Um, if you just, we just have one more minute. I was just curious if there was like any, like the biggest surprise that came out in putting this together. Was there a challenge that you had to overcome in order to make this tool reality or something, some unintended benefit that you weren't expecting that, you know, came out of having this available or the process of putting it together? But I have a couple of things that come to mind, but I'll, I'll let Ashley go first if she wants. If there's anything she wants to say. Well, I mean, I, I actually came along towards the end of this, but I think the, I don't know, I guess there were definitely a lot of challenges. I mean, software and programming this kind of original tool took a lot of, uh, overcoming a lot of hurdles. Um, I think that what's been really exciting has been digging into the strategy database and just realizing how many adaptation strategies are out there. And as, we pre as we've been presenting it just this week alone, how many people have contacted us to say they'd like to add to their adaptation strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's been really exciting. Yeah, um, that is exciting. There's a lot of on-the-ground action. Cool. Yeah. yeah, see, I let Ashley go first, and then she stole both my ideas. <laughs> ah, there you go. You've been working yeah. together too long. So you know, I, I think the, the things that I noticed, so, so certainly the technical aspect of putting together this tool, I, I think really sort of 
solidified it for me, the need to put together data in consistent formats um, so that adaptation users uh, can, can start working with the data uh, more easily. So kind of thinking about things in a Google method where you know, Google's not presenting you a lot of the final product, but they're giving you the maps or the utilities to do uh, further stuff, you know, getting data into that format where you can quickly apply it to different areas, I think that is really a need. And, and I think after having gone through those challenges and putting this together, uh, you know, there are aspects of this that we're very happy with and that has really highlighted, uh, you know, we, we did it simply because we looked at it and said, you know, we really, you know, this is a, a key conversation piece that, that needs to be there that isn't. Uh, but then after having do it and the interest that it's generated, I think it's been pretty clear that, you know, this is an effort that really needs to happen elsewhere and more broadly about getting information, uh, you know, integrating information together in an accessible format that's easier for users to, to play with. Um, that's really the key thing, I think. Great. One other thing, I, I go back to the, the last question about uh, tools for other parts of the country. Uh, so climate.gov just, uh, rolled out their climate resilient toolkit, um, and there's also a lot of good information on there for different parts of the country. So that's that's a, a resource certainly to check out as well. Excellent. All right. Well, very good. I wanted to thank you both again for the presentation and thank everyone who participated in the webinar. We have recorded it, so it'll be available on the American Society of Adaptation professionals website so thank you for joining us and hope everybody has a very happy holiday season thank you sasha thanks ashley